You seem to be a bottomless bit of information. That's great that you want to share it like you do, you know? <laughs> well, I think it's Because it's all about hoarding it, you know, and trying to figure out a way to, you know, put it on a scale and give you a little bit, you know? No, we, we, we want this Large game and tiny print. No, we want it in, in large print so that our children and those who have no hope can understand that their future is in their hands. If people who were in slavery or prisoners of war, indentured, whatever term you want to apply to not having any freedom of choice, were able to get freedom of choice through their own efforts without the aid of anybody else except their own people, if they could do it in those times with those limited resources, with the opportunities that are available today, our children have no limitations and we have no limitations. What's left for us to do is apply some of the lessons that our ancestors learned already and apply those lessons to today's situation. And one of the, we've talked about some of them. Sometimes it's all right to have a squabble in public but resolve it behind closed doors like families do. And other times, uh, another thing is, there is no reason why we can't assist other people and assist other communities because at the end of the day, we have to do business with those other communities. So, yes well, sir. On that note, let's go back to the Black Wall Street. Perfect example of what you just said. Now Black Wall Street is very interesting because even though some of it is known because a similar incident was put in the movie, um, what was Red it? Tails. Uh, uh, I'm talking about the one, the other movie, uh, Rosewood. Uh, Rosewood. And w w one of the things when that I didn't talking about Red Tails. Uh, Rosewood. Go ahead. Rosewood. One of the things that I didn't know. I grew up in the '60s, so when I heard about a riot, I always thought a riot meant that that was black people tearing up black neighborhoods. That's what I thought a riot was. Mm -hmm. Come to find out in American history, there's been a whole history of riots. Only in American history before the 60s, riots meant people from white communities invading black communities and burning down black businesses. Creating now, a riot. Th that, that's, that's what a riot was. Now, one of the interesting things about Black Wall Street, and it wasn't just Black Wall Street, there was a, they actually called it the red, the first red hot summer wasn't in the 60s. The first red hot summer was 1919. And it was actually, uh, you talked about the, some of the conflict between uh, 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 Booker T. Washington, uh, excuse me, um, uh, uh, Marcus Garvey and Du Bois. And du Bois. One of the things I found out, during World War, because there had been a history after the Civil War and after the Spanish-American War, Woodrow Wilson had a cabinet-level meeting about what are we going to do about these returning black soldiers from Europe. Uh -huh. Because in the past, when black soldiers after war, like after the Civil War and after the Spanish-American War, when they returned, they had a very different attitude toward their situation. And they were much more, let's say, aggressive or radical in terms of dealing with things. So this uh, summer of 1919 takes place with the background of the President of the United States trying to develop a strategy uh, to deal with the returning black soldiers and how to keep things under control. And one of the prominent people that came to light in those days, that was the first time before the Federal Bureau of Investigation, was J. Edgar Hoover. And the first COINTELPRO program that is spying on black political leaders was actually during the summer of 1919. And that was when J. Edgar Hoover was head of, um, it was called the Central Bureau of Investigation at that time, the predecessor to the FBI. And it was called, the, the organization that they were spying on was called the African Brotherhood. And these were brothers that were advocating going back to Africa and other things at that time. But the important thing about 1919, the Red Hot Summer was, the, that was a summer where all across America, uh, people from white communities, because whatever reasons, jobs, the economy, went into black communities and invaded. Now, Wall Street was, was the black Wall Street was in Oklahoma. We don't want you, but we don't want you to leave us either. In other words, you know, they were spying on us because uh, we were trying to make an effort to get out of here.
we, we not only were we making an effort to get out of here, but all kinds of people were involved in but that. But that's effort. what I'm saying, you know. And and I don't and, I don't want you, and I don't want nobody else to have you. And and that was the first time where communists became applied to oh, black yeah. freedom oh, yeah. movement. Oh, yeah. And that was a strategy. Paul the Robeson right around the corner. It, it, Labeled him. Right. And and Paul Robeson comes from a whole list of entrepreneurs. His, his ancestor was Cyril Bustill in the 1700s and 1800s. Oh, I understand. And, and, and gave rise to Paul Robeson. And Paul Robeson is an interesting character because he was connected with Oscar Michaud, the most prolific black filmmaker in American history. Um, and he gave Paul Robeson a starring role in a silent film, um, I forget the name of it, but there are all these connections with these people, but Black Wall Street was in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and it was also the first move situation. What I mean by that was, that was the first time in American history where airplanes were used to bomb American citizens. In and the it, history of America. In the history of America, history that of America. was the first time airplanes were used to bomb American citizens. Another time, and the second time that happened was in move here in Philadelphia when they dropped the bomb from the helicopter. But it first happened in Tulsa, Oklahoma during, during Black, Black Wall, Wall Street. Street. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that has to be told... But well, let's tell about the thriving business that they created. Let's talk about how we were able to come together and through uh, segregation, we were able to build this empire that made us the envy of all of the people that participated in the riots and the bombing and the destruction of uh, uh, Oklahoma during that period of time. And uh, how, we, how, we, how we caught so much hell trying to get back on our feet after that. Because it was one thing to just burn us out and do the mean things that they did. But every time we tried to get back on our feet, they would come up with different ordinances that would restrict us from, like, you couldn't have a tent. So where are you going to live? Well, that's, that's the key to what you're saying. I always thought through textbooks and the traditional history that's taught that the black movement was about civil rights. But when you look at it, what happened in America is not that blacks were denied their civil rights, but every time there was an economic advancement, a law was instituted to take away that economic gain. So it was about the loss. The fight in America that black people have has not been so much about civil rights, but it's fighting for economic rights. And human rights. Which goes along with human rights. That's because we should have been at economics the is a study or how do we allocate scarce resources? land, labor, capital, and time. Now, human rights is what rights you have as a human being, your time, your labor, and you should enjoy the fruits of that. Well, it's not about whether we should have the vote. It was about the economic advancements, the businesses, not just the bit, but the communities that we created. There's two trends in African-American entrepreneurial history. There's a trend of when our markets were primarily white people, and there's a trend when by law, by legislation, by practice, when those markets were denied to us, then we built up our own markets among ourselves. It's been traditionally taught that we developed black business because we couldn't get involved with white business. It was actually the opposite. What happened first in history is black folks were fabulously successful selling to whites. And since the, it wasn't, they created an unfair playing ground to take away the success of black entrepreneurs. So that's when people began to look at, let's do it amongst ourselves. Since we can't sell to this market of whites, let's sell to black markets. And that's been the, the trend in history. So Black Wall Street happened during a, a time after white markets were largely closed to blacks, that blacks developed their own banks, their own insurance companies, their own hospitals, their own schools. Two banks were burned down there, two different banks in that one community. They had hospitals that were burned down, their own hospitals. It was a time where because we weren't able to deal with the larger white American market, we 
developed our own internal markets and created thriving communities. It wasn't about one business. It was about a community of businesses. So uh, the, the trend is when we were able to sell to white markets, there was generally one entrepreneur, one business, and, and there wasn't a community of businesses organized. When those markets were closed off, as they are unofficially today, not necessarily by legislation, although when we look at these affirmative action, the rollback of affirmative action, led to, what's so damaging about that? If you look at history, affirmative action <coughs> is necessary because the government has to protect us from what happened, what was done to us by the larger white community, like Wall Street. Those were people who invaded black communities to burn down black businesses, just like in Rosewood. We, had, they were, we were no threat, no competition, because they weren't interested in that market. So they were involved in coming into our communities. So we were a threat. We were a threat. The Ku Klux Klan saw us as a threat because they didn't want that idea to get any further than it was. Um, and let me kind of bring you up to speed well, to where we can, are. Can I, can I add to you sure, about that? Sure. One of the things that um, I read about when reading about Booker T. Washington, I, I, I'd always grown up thinking that Booker T. Washington, uh, and, and I'll use the word, was an Uncle Tom. And I now think that he was one of the greatest thinkers in African American history. Booker T. Washington He did what he had to do to get done what he wanted to get done. But when you read what he wrote, one of the things that he was saying, there were things that he said to white folks, there were things that he said to black folks, and there were ways that he spent his money. One of the things that he said that is what we're trying to do today, he said that any people that could sell on the world market have nothing to worry about when it comes to the politics of their community. Well, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to sell to the world market today. Another thing he did was he was a supporter of all sorts of political people that you would not necessarily think he was involved with through not only his Tuskegee Institute and Tuskegee University, but through the meetings and sit-downs he would have where he funded various political candidates to do various things. And his black business, uh, he formed a black business league that included everybody and that was one of the main sources of information about what was going on in black business. Now I mentioned, you know, the, the, the reason, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but no the thing I wanted to mention was that at the Atlanta Exposition, we tend to, we, we heard the speech about the five fingers and the separation, but one of the... But that of, was one of his great fundraising speeches. Exactly. But at another speech... When White they were, folks love to hear that one. Yeah, they, they did. Tell us. But at that same time, when he was talking about black folks doing for themselves, one of the men in that audience said to the other uh, uh, white men in the audience, don't you people understand this is the most dangerous black man in America? And why was he the most dangerous? Because he talked about doing economically for self. And that's why he remains the thinker of choice today. Do economically for yourself. Sell on the world market. Now, one thing that's not known about Booker T. Washington is that the Nordic model of economic development uh, uh, used by the Scandinavian country, that is Norway, Nokia, uh, Ikea in Sweden, these nations, these so-called um, social democratic nations, they got a lot of their programs from Tuskegee Institute, Booker T. Washington. So these European nations developed their economic plan from what they learned from Booker T. Washington. This is something that's not being taught, not being promulgated, and uh, now it, the traditional people don't want to look at it, econ economists don't want to look at it because that so-called social democratic model is out of favor. But that came from Booker T. Washington. So if Europe, Europeans can use his model to develop, why can't we use that model to develop today? Well, let me let me um, inject on, on, on my thoughts on Booker T. Washington. Number one, uh, he came across, even as intelligent as he was, he came across as um, a person that wanted to create the uh, workforce for America. He uh, had advocated that um, he wanted to um, teach the labor force how to be a better labor force, the uh, bricklayers, the... Uh, uh, builders, the uh, uh, maintenance and so forth, you know? And then what happened was, uh, Europe, the Europeans loved that. that, that sounded great. 
And uh, the speech that uh, <clears throat> he made that was the closing of his uh, uh, fundraising speeches was uh, when it comes to um, the financial institutions in America, we should be as separate as the uh, five fingers on our hand. But when it comes to the defense, this is the separation between Europeans and, 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 and the African uh, community. But when it comes to the defense of America, we should be as tight as, so we should all come together to the defense of America. But when it comes to trying to get into the stock market, trying to get into the financial institutions, etc., now he had different uh, ulterior motives. But this was the speech that he gave to the fundraising uh, audiences that were funding his uh, Tuskegee Institute. And for a large part, uh, as smart as he was, there was a lot of things that went down that were positive. Uh, you had the uh, syphilis uh, uh, experiment that went on there, uh, which kind of got swept under the carpet. So, and then you had uh, Brother George Washington Carver, who gave away all of his patents. So all of these uh, discoveries that he had uh, did while he was a part of that, because they were so patriotic. I mean, there's nobody more patriotic than we are. The most patriotic beings here in America when it comes to defending, when it comes to loving, when it comes to being neighborly, when it comes to helping our neighbor, uh, when it just comes to loving, uh, there's nobody greater than we are. In, in defense of Booker T to some extent, the Tuskegee experiment happened after he was dead. And it did happen at Tuskegee Institute, at Tuskegee Institute. But, but, but he was dead. In defense, in terms of George Washington Carver, who turned down going with General Electric, who turned down going with Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison? He, uh, uh, Henry Ford? Uh, yes, all these people he turned down and stayed at Tuskegee Institute. Now, here's the thing that we have to ask ourselves. Uh, what black-owned business could have taken advantage of his inventions what alternative did he have other than to give them away? At least he was able to be, and I'm only putting this as an alternative to think about, at least he was able to be a conduit for fundraising for Tuskegee. Had he sold, had he gone with any one of these other businesses, only that business would have benefited and not Tuskegee Institute itself. And then the other thing about Booker T, look at where his money went. Don't look at what he said because he said a lot of things in front of people. The Negro oh, I Business totally League. Agree. I totally the agree. Negro Business League was 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 an organization where a bunch of black entrepreneurs and business owners got together to advance and help themselves. What's wrong? What's wrong with us helping ourselves? What's wrong with us building our own banks? What's wrong with us building our own insurance companies, our own hospitals? our own institutions, not because, in today's world, not because we don't have access to other institutions, but because let's turn our creativity, let's build up our creativity, let's serve each other, let's create more markets, more jobs, more investment in ourselves. And that's what Booker T. Washington was talking about in that day. Admittedly, he had one story for his donors and he had another story in his actions and that's a man of the 21st century not just a man of the 19th and 20th century to me he's a very complicated individual but what about our um but what about our children because uh we're running out of tape and we want to wrap that up what about our children today um selling death and destruction i mean not all of them because we have some i mean it's only a small percentage but the ones that um, don't have any knowledge of this uh, coming togetherness, don't have any um, uh, foundation for uh, future generations. And give me mine right now. Some of us think that, uh, some of us have thought that the only way out, many of our children and young people think that the only way out, the only way to accumulate capital is through crime. And that's the only well, alternative we have. That's the record why we had, sales and the rap music, that's not crime. I mean, Okay, uh, uh, crime. And when I looked on the black enterprise, uh, richest 20 black Americans, 17 of them 
were either in entertainment or sports. 17 of the 20. The other three were in construction, real estate, and a, uh, a, a, job, uh, a job finding firm. And the other 17 were in sports or entertainment. So now, that's the, the, the lesson of history is that's not the only place. That's not the only place. We have other opportunities as entrepreneurs. We have the internet, a tool that didn't exist before. We have other opportunities to create from the ground to the marketplace opportunities for business. We can be entertainers and we can be more. Brother White, look in the camera and tell our children what they need to do to come together. we got maybe two minutes left. What we need to do is that you have to develop the idea that you come from a race of great people that were able to not only start civilization, but teach other people civilization. And somehow some of your ancestors forgot to teach you that you come from a great people, that you are in fact God's chosen people. And as God's chosen people, you can do for self. The only limitation you have is the limitation that you set on yourself. So don't limit yourself to what other people say is what you can do. What you can do is anything that you set your mind to do. So set your mind to developing your community for your family, for your parents, for your brothers and sisters, so that you could bring something new to the world. Develop a skill. And I don't mean necessarily that you have to go to school. Know something better than anybody else knows it and take it to the marketplace. You can do that. Don't rest on your laurel. Don't give up. Don't say that this is the only opportunity I have. The world is your opportunity. Look to the world and take advantage of it. I concur. Brother White, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very you. much. Thank and you. I hope we can do this again. My pleasure. I'm Carvel Watson for the... You got a center? Yeah, thank you. Move the camera. We straight? Okay. Um, for Carvel Watson for the Job Man Caravan on location at the ACAF African Cultural Art Forum, 52nd and Chancellor Street in West Philadelphia. Uh, we want to thank you for joining us. And... Um, you can go to our website if you missed the broadcast for the bibliography on some of these great uh, Africans that uh, this brother has mentioned during the interview. We're going to say peace, love, and power. There you go. Thank you. Positive. Okay. Uh, yes, my name's Carvel Watson. I'm the producer director for Studio 2 VideoProductions.com. And the production that you're watching now is either MediaAdvocates.com or TheJobManCaravan.com. And uh, what we're attempting to do with our what we're attempting to do with our television production is we're attempting to give a voice to the voiceless. What we want to do is we want to allow people that uh, can see wrongs and injustice and uh, misrepresentations of us to be able to have a format as to where they can uh, speak up and uh, let everyone else know that they're not alone in their feelings and their thoughts. So through television, through the communications media, through our website broadcast, this will allow hundreds of thousands of millions of people to actually tune in and know that they're not alone because the same thing's happening to us in Philadelphia. It's happening in Chicago. It's happening in New York. It's happening in Atlanta. It's happening everywhere. And unfortunately, the communications media doesn't give us the opportunity to know this because they make you think that it's isolated affair. Uh, young brother uh, got shot down for uh, some dumb reason. Uh, here in Philadelphia a couple of weeks ago, we had a beautiful queen that was shot down, mother of four, indiscriminately. Some fool shot into a crowd, hit her twice. Now her husband has to raise his four children, and all that he had
thought would happen in the future, the weddings, the high school graduations, to watch their children flourish, it's no more. He has to do all of that. When he came home uh, and his dinner was ready, he has to cook dinner now. Uh, when mom helped the children out with their homework, he has to do that now. So this family has been disrupted over some foolishness, over guns, over some nonsense that didn't even matter, and lives have been destructed. Not only the family of the, of the, of the sister that got slain, but of the youngster that shot the bullet, because his life is no more. Unfortunately, uh, he shot the daughter of a real powerful spiritual brother. And even though the spiritual brother thought that it was the creator's will and forgave the guy who did it, I'm pretty sure when that boy go to jail, they got inmates in there that ain't gonna feel the same way. So now his life's gonna be a living hell because he has the stigma of killing a spiritual brother. I'm not gonna go into the religion, but this brother was well powerful. He was well liked and well loved. And if he came into a room, everybody straightened out because he was sincere about his belief in God, his belief in uh, us being human beings, and he practiced what he preached. So this fool took his child away from him. And this is happening all over the United States, maybe all over the world. So what we want is we want you to send in your less than two minute video about how you see the world, about how you see the communications media, about how you see us being misrepresented, about how we can come together as a race of people and stop doing some of the dumb nonsense that we see on television. We see it, but we don't see the positive. We don't see the greatness. We don't see the child prodigy, the uh, A student, the honor roll students. We don't see the uh, parent or the neighborhood person that steps out and become a, a vanguard in the neighborhood that uh, does great things for all of the children and all the people that are around them. No, you wanna show us the negative side of ourselves and our television show and our website television production is a counter to all of that. So what we want you to do is however you see the communications media, whether it be positive, we need to let the uh, producers of the shows know that we like the positive thing that we see. We want you to keep it up. We want you to encourage others to take note and come up with a positive show or a positive presentation. But when it's negative, we want to be able to collectively speak out against it because there's certain ethnic groups that you will not insult. And you know you will not insult them because if you do, they're gonna raise so much cane that you're gonna wish you never mentioned their name. You can't even insult uh, people that are, are disabled. They come together. Anytime you come out and uh, misrepresent them or disrespect them, they come together and straighten you out. But it seems like us, the African-American race, people of color, uh, whatever their hue might be, and whatever their uh, nationality might be, because we're all getting bit by the same dog, and we need to be able to speak up and bring attention to our plight and bring attention to our representation. We control the communications industry. The communications industry has a license. That license allows them to broadcast what they call community programming. And what they do is they are also allowed to sell commercial space on their broadcast network. We are the ones that decide how much they charge per commercial because of the attendance and the shows that we watch. And every year, they have to come up in front of a license board to renew their license. If we don't like what they're doing, we need to be at that meeting in full force. And we need to set out our grievances. If we write them and we tell them we don't like what they're doing and how they're projecting us in the news media and the type of shows that they're putting on where we always got a laugh track underneath of us or we stereotyped or we buffooning and acting like fools, then we need to tell them we don't like that. And if they don't correct it, then we need to go to that meeting. And we need to let the board members and the license board know that we don't like this. That's how you get the problem resolved. But sitting around beefing and being angry and taking it out on your brother and sister, that's not a solution. 
you're adding on to the problem. You're giving them fata, you're giving them material that they can use to paint us with this broad brush as being negative. And we are the children of the great ancestors who were at the center of scientific learning in our homeland before we came to America. So that blood is still rich in our veins. And if you're going to let people try to make a fool out of you and turn you around in 400 years and erase 20 and 30,000 years of development, of human development, then that's on you. But the TV show is about letting you know that there are alternatives, and we need you to write us and let us know who you are so we can give you the credit you deserve if you're doing some great things. We need you to send us a video and let us know who you are so that we can let other one people know that you're not alone if you're trying to feed the hungry, trying to house the homeless, trying to uh, give jobs to the people that are out of work, try to vote collectively so that our vote will mean something so that we will get something before the election and not wait until after the election and we don't wind up with anything. So this is the whole scenario that we try to create with the job man caravan, the mediaadvocates.com, and we have a social network entitled the, what is it again? The showbizbook.com. So on that note, I'm Carvel Watson on location, giving you my commentary, hoping that you'll tune in and pass the word on so we can build up our client base and we can build up our um, our uh, show viewership. And uh, this is all about you. And we're not the only one that has attempted to bring us together. There have been greater people than myself through my lifetime. We had the King movement. We had the Marcus Garvey movement. We had the Noble Drew Ali movement. We had great people. We had the uh, uh, um, brother um, Medford. What was his name? Jesus Christ. Okay. Um, we had great people that came before me that tried to bring us together. And uh, all of us are great. And we all need to come together and stop this foolishness. We need to stick with our families and raise our children, not have children all over the place. How can you do that? How can you, how can you do that? And a lot of fathers that walked away from their children are sorry right now. I know a lot of great athletes don't want to have nothing to do with their parents. I know a lot of uh, uh, children that raised up to be great that won't have anything to do with their parents because their parent, at least their father, had abandoned them when they were children. Let's cut this foolishness out. If we bring a child into the world, we should be strong enough and adult enough and human enough to raise them. So on location, this is Carvel Watson signing off, and we hope you become a part of our network. We'll show you the information at the end of the show. Thank you so much. God bless and be strong.